<clears throat> hey YouTube, it's Eric. Um, in this video, I'm just going to be sharing to you a very good book that I uh, found on the internet. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm surprised that I found this work just because of the author. The author is Lord Robert Montagu. I'm going to explain the context a bit, but um, I'm going to show you. Lord Montagu wrote a great book exposing the Jesuits, ex particularly the Jesuit agenda in England and Ireland in the late 1800s. This book was written in 1886. And the reason I was just surprised to see this is because Lord Robert Montagu, I have his other book, um, you can get a free PDF of it, but he translated in a book from an Italian P. Franco in 1874. And it was literally strict Roman Catholicism. Like in that book, that the, the first book that uh, Montagu translated, he's talking about how he's praising the Jesuits and he's basically threatening anyone that if you rebel against the Jesuits, you're going to be destroyed. And then uh, I guess in between that publishing and this later book that he published, he had a complete like change of heart, a change of uh, morality on the inside. Uh, I guess he, he probably, I, I assume he learned of like the true nature of the diabolical Jesuit art. And uh, he realized he was being played as a useless idiot. Um, but I'm going to show you the book here. And I'm going to read to you a few interesting quotes. I think if uh, I noticed a few, uh, a few of the viewers who watch my channel have mentioned they're from Ireland. If you're, if you're definitely, if you're from Ireland and England, this book will definitely interest you. I linked the link to it in the description. I link, here's the PDF I got up. I'm going to read a little bit of it from page 70. Here's the book here. It's called Recent Events and, their, uh, and a Clue to Their Solution, Lord Robert Montagu, published 1886. And in particular, the Prime Minister of England, uh, he, goes, or he goes into a lot of William Gladstone in this book, uh, quite a bit, how Gladstone was controlled. And uh, interesting here, uh, you see Gladstone, uh, he, he writes about this stuff. From what I've been going through this for about an hour. He does write... Uh, it's a long book. I'm not giving it its justice. It's like 700 pages. But Montague does write quite a bit about how the Jesuits plan to um, uh, take complete control of the Church of England and the uh, Church of Ireland. And you see here, Gladstone introduced secret voting. And Montague really exposes well Blackstone's Jesuitical sophistry. Montague like, was very intelligent, like being in the government. Um, here's his uh, Wikipedia. I'm just going to read to you a little background on Montagu. Um, actually, I'll show you the other book that I'll... The, this was the book that it's a complete 180. This book here on some popular errors concerning politics and religion was uh, Ro Lord Robert Montagu like, translating an official papal book. And then he... This book came out 14 years later. And, like, and I'm just... Like, I'm going to read you some of the dialogue. Like it, This book here, literally, he calls the Pope in the shining, illuminating sun that shines his rays upon all other princes of the earth. And in this book, he says that Protestantism, like Protestants don't have the right to believe that truth is on their side. And in this book, he's warning Protestants about the Jesuit diabolical takeover of society. So I just thought that was interesting. Those are the two books. Here's his page here. He was the vice president of the Committee on Education. I'm just gonna see if anyone's in the chat. Yeah, but this is, uh, this is just some context on that first book I mentioned before I get into his new book. Um, this is, I'm quoting from R.W. Thompson. Uh, During the progress of the Italian Revolution in 1868, a work appeared in Italy from the pen of P. Franco, wherein the relations between the church and secular governments, as well as individuals and communities, were elaborately discussed. This work was evidently authoritative, and if it did not have special approval of Pius IX, it, uh, it undoubtedly had that of those high positions in the Vatican. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to read all this. I don't want the video to go too long. But you see here, uh, after the decree was passed, it was considered important that this work of Franco should be translated into the English language, so as to bring all English-speaking Roman Catholics to the point of expecting, uh, accepting papal infallibility, both as an accomplished fact and the only true religious faith, and to confu uh, convince them of the enormous sin that they would commit by refusing to do so. Lord Robert Montagu, a Roman Catholic member of the British Parliament, became the translator following the original, as far as he considered it uh, expedient upon the points of religious doctrine and adding some function, uh, adding some reflections of his own. And you see here, it was published in London in 1874, 428 pages, and that was the book I showed you. You can get it for free on Google Books, uh, titled On Some Errors Concerning Politics and Religion. And that book uh, Montagu translated was like, from an official Vatican uh, book from an Italian P. Franco. 
So that, like, I recommend you read that book too. But this is the new book that I found from uh, Montague here. Very completely does a 180. <laughs> um, uh, let me see here. Um, okay, so this is a bit of uh, talking. This is Montague talking a bit about the Church of England. This is page 70 of his book here. One extract from the uh, communist or the communicants manual published by the Bishop of Lincoln will suffice quote concentration is the central act of the service by which the bread and wine are made verily and indeed the body and blood of Christ are offered to God the Father as the Eucharist uh, Eucharistic sacrifice end quote and therefore he teaches his people to say to the bread after consecration quote uh, my Lord and my Lord and my God end quote devotedly I adore the deity unseen end quote etc the, quote, eastward position is now adopted in the cathedrals of St. Paul's, London, Chester, Lincoln, Litchfield, Liverpool, Manchester, Norwich, Oxford, St. Albans, Truro, Worcester, and York. And how can anyone uh, who reads such things and considers them easily refrain from concluding that such appointments by Mr. Gladstone, this is the Mr. Gladstone here, yeah, that such appointments made by Mr. Gladstone are parts of a deep laid plan to fill the church with partisans of the Roman church and in order to accustom the lady to accept the doctrines and, and follow the practices and adopt the symbols of the Roman church. So that at last the church of England may be absorbed by the church of Rome. Nor is, it the, uh, nor is this the plan confined to the bishops and clergy alone. Last year, Mr. Gladstone expressed himself warmly in favor of of a society for working men and of advancing Romanis, Romanizing character, quote, the Church of England Working Men's Society, end quote. And by his countenance and enormities, he has done all he could to extend the influence of that society among the working classes, as he does his best to shield the ritualistic clergy from adverse tribunals by the appointment of sympath sympathizing bishops. So he seems anxious to support the ritualistic clergy in their practices by Romanizing their congregations. I have often heard from Jesuits that their hope of Romanizing England lies in the upper class, upper classes and working men, not in the middle classes. Uh, I will conclude this letter by quoting un, unimpeachable testimony to the fact of this, uh, that this Romanizing conspiracy has been carried out on already for 40 years. Lord John Russell in 1850 wrote this famous protest called the Durham letter uh, at which Mr. D, uh, D. Israeli sneered in his latest novel. Lord John Russell said, quote, there is a danger which alarms, uh, there's a danger which alarms me much more than any aggression of a foreign sovereign. Clergymen of our own church who have subscribed the 39 articles and acknowledged in the explicit terms, the Queen's supremacy have been the most forward in leading their flock step by step to the verge of the precipice. I have little hope that the propounders and framers of these uh, innovations will desist from their insidious course. No, they have not uh, desisted, for in the words of the Jesuit, quote, they are the net which uh, the Church of Rome employs to bring the Church of England over to herself, end quote. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read up to page 76 here, because there's one really good excerpt that I want to share with you guys from this book. I'm just going to see if anyone's uh, in the video. Yeah, definitely, if you're, guy, if you're from England and, or Ireland, definitely read this book, because Montagu centers this book around England and Ireland in the late 1800s. Okay, and this is Lord Montague here. In December 1882, I received a letter from a very learned canon of the English church in which he said, quote, I am surprised at nothing the Jesuits have ever done or planned. They are like a cancer of, on the Church of Rome, or rather like the when in Milton's parable, uh, no, it's Milton's Paradise, which quarreled for supremacy with the uh, with the head. I dread their influence in this diocese, that's the Jesuits, for the stupidness of our clergy and people is simply deplorable. They were very dangerous when they were in the front of their generation, but then we were better able to detect their plans of evil. They are more and so now that their ignorance uh, compels them to follow up in the, in the rear of civilization, for we can less uh, see what they are doing or discern their plots. That's the Jesuit plots. I imagine that the way they, that the Jesuits insinuate themselves into families and become the masters of the history of family life must render themselves as dangerous to society as they were even they led the education of the great. This kind of work can be done by very inferior minds, very, very inferior minds. And this is very, this very inferiority makes it more dangerous and odious in its character. 
Lord Russell told me that he believed that there were Jesuits in the Church of England, and but for the stupidity of our, stupidity of our rituals, which makes them more imprudent even than the modern Jesuits, I could well believe it. Will you believe that at the Paris Church on Sunday uh, last, the curate, the curate asked the congregation for their prayers for the repose of the soul of the Archbishop? So that's a quote that Montague got. And you see in a subsequent letter, the canon said, Lord John Russell distinctly expressed his belief that there were Jesuits among the clergy of the Church of England, which I almost think must be in some form or another true. I cannot say how, unless like John Ingolstadt, they are permitted by their spiritual director to remain in the church doing the work of the Roman apostles. Uh, this is blocked out here. When I asked Mr. Uh, blocked out, what was the meaning of the closet, uh, the, cl the closet behind his altar? He replied, was his reply was quote uh that is with the view of better times end quote he said this uh he said the same to the bishop of and he, and he doesn't name his bishop uh quote when he made uh when he made like an inquiry the clergyman mentioned the, uh, the clergyman mentioned by the canon said to me uh one evening quote my great ambition is to die a jesuit brother end quote he did not say a quote jesuit priest or a jesuit father be it remarked but he was a married man and, a ref and referred doubtless to the third order of the lay Jesuits. There are many who approach the very near, uh, the very near of that clergyman, the members of the quote society of the Holy Cross, uh, for example, and they are very numerous according to their statues. They quote, say mass for their departed brethren and quote, and they quote, say mass for the intention of the society. And they quote, say mass daily end quote. <laughs> okay. Uh, they quote frequent of the uh, they frequent of the sacrament of penance end quote and they are quote sworn celibates. Numbers of books are annually published to do the same work as those ritualists are commissioned to perform. The quote Irish Church Almanac for last year speaks of the Reformation as having been completed when Henry the Eighth quote that unscrupulous monarch threw off his allegiance to the Pope end quote. It does not seem that the Jesuits in the church and the ritualistic appointments by prime ministers have met with all success that was looked for. For bribes and even terrorists, terrorism threats and menaces have been resorted to for the spread of Romanist practices. The Times of April 10th, 1882 furnishes us with an example of that method. The vicar of the Holy Trinity Church, Liverpool, alleged that, quote, uh, threats and promises have been freely used to induce uh, him to surrender the simple and faithful worship of the Reformed Church of England, end quote. He said, quote, the utmost pressure is brought to bear upon me to adopt the ancient and modern hymns, which in turn, my opinion, teach, among other questionable doctrines, the transubstantiation and the worship of the Virgin Mary. From December to the middle of March, strong and unentiring efforts have been made to get me to introduce the foregoing hymn book and to make the church service less and less congregational. Uh, I was also strongly urged to have, commun uh, to have the communion table, called in this case the altar, covered with, the, covered with black on Good Friday, and to have on Easter Sunday with, on the same table a cross with flowers, uh, end quote, and so forth. Uh, with all such practice rampant throughout this kingdom with rewards and menaces uh, throughout the kingdom, that's the kingdom of Britain, uh, with rewards and menaces from high quarters with the favor shown to the ritualists and the aversion evinced towards the simple Christians by those in authority with the continual <clears throat> with the continual appointments of ritualists uh, to bishoprics and rich canonries. How can we wonder at the triumph of the tone of the Pope's newspaper in England? The journal or the Pope's newspaper, I think this is a French paper, the Journal de Rome on February 17th, 1884, when it exclaimed in joy, quote, ritualistic movement in England towards the establishment of the Catholic institutions continues without ceasing. Setting up of images in the cathedrals, which has been profaned by Protestantism, is most consoling. Nor is it only in the setting up of images of the saints that the tendency of ritualism towards the Catholic Church is manifested. The practice of the auricular confession among Protestant rituals is now nearly universal. Even the formula of confession is touched as couched in Catholic language. Here it is, quote, I confess to the Almighty God, to the Holy Virgin Mary, and to the all saints, and to you, my Father, that I have sinned, end quote. And notice how like, the Holy Virgin Mary and the all saints is all capitals. Hey, what's up, Harp? How's it going, man? Um... And you see here, after an explanation of the mode in which the, the particular sins have been enumerated, the formula continues, quote, 
I humbly crave pardon of God and you, my Father, and I ask for repentance, for counsel, and for absolution, and I pray the Holy Virgin and all the saints, and you, my Father, to pray for me to God, our Master. Amen. Is it not that in advance of a matter of the highest import? Uh, is it not the first time that the rituals have prayed directly to the Holy Virgin and to the saints? End quote, says the papal organ in its triumph. <laughs> Uh, the same papal journal on April 27, 1884, not only uh, shows to what extent Jesuits and Jesuit, Jesuit tutored persons have been surreptitiously placed uh, in the Church of England, but it also proves the activity which those persons have been pushed towards the advanced in honor and power by the treacherous government in England. Uh, quote, this is continuing from the Roman newspaper. Ritualism, that is to say, the imitation of the forms and usages of the Church of Rome is introduced more and more into the Church of England. The days of the Holy Week have given renewed proofs of this fact. They organized the following devotions, the three hours, the three stations of the cross with the usual pictures, and the tenebrae. Moreover, it is no longer simple clergymen who give themselves up to ritualism, but is also the highest dignitaries of the Church. At St. Paul's Canon, uh, at St. Paul's Canon, Scott Holland preached the three hours assisted by the Archbishop of Canterbury. At Upper Clapton, it was the Bishop of Bedford. And again, at St. Paul's, it was the Bishop of Rochester who conducted the spiritual exercises, <laughs> the exercises of Loyola. Uh, or th that could just be like the regular church's exercise. I don't know if that's a reference to the Ignatian spiritual exercises. But he's continuing here. The This is continuing from the papal uh, organ that Montague's quoting from. Movement has also been extended to the provinces at Litchfield, Bishop Macklin, at Worcester, Canon Knox Little led those devotions in the cathedrals of those cities while the strains of the Catholic music were heard. In the church of the St. Alban, they lit a paschal candle on All Saints Day. They burned an immense number of candles and they decorated with particular care the altars to the right and the left of the high altar. And the Reverend Vicar, Dr. F.G. Lee, after a sermon, made a procession around his, uh, around, around his church. At Presbytery, uh, a clergyman was dis uh, disposed by his bishop because of his ritualistic opinions and at once set himself in an open rebellion against the decision of the bishop and declared to his congregation with their approval that he would not diminish one jot from his ritualistic practices. It is not required to be said that we witness with delight how ritualism is bringing back the prodigal Church of England into her mother church, that is the Church of Rome. And we await from that moment the greatest benefit to the cause of truth, end quote. <laughs> this is back to Robert Montague. Hill wrote the Pope's journal on April 27th, 1884. Two days after it made the announcement with what truth I cannot say that, quote, the monarchy of England represented by the Prince of Wales assisted on Good Friday at the, uh, at the three hours in one of the most important churches in London, end quote. These are facts sufficient of themselves to open the eyes of any thoughtful man as to what is being plotted and maneuvered in the Church of England by the wire pullers of the Romanist Church. I have mentioned enough, surely, to confirm in our minds the statement of the Jesuits that they have rituals, they have rituals in the Church of England as, quote, the net which they hope to bring the Church of England over to Rome, end quote. This is a good quote I wanted to show you here, and I'm going to... Uh, wrap up the video pretty quick with this, but I recommend you guys read this whole book and I'm going to start, I haven't gone through this whole book yet either. I've only gone through about 90 pages, but it's really, really good. Um, so this is back to Lord Robert Montague. <clears throat> when we remember that the leaders of political parties were only in a simulated opposition while they were really cooperating and working together to advance the papal cause in England. And he's writing this in 1886. Okay. Uh, when we see the ritualists in the church, as well as those who have uh, who have Romanizing tendencies in Parliament, advanced and pushed up to the top of affairs, so that England may be ever kept between quote the upper and nether millstone of popery. When uh, we remember, moreover, that there are many who, in their hearts, adore this papist conspiracy, but yet have to labor for it and hold their tongues because, by the adroitness of Jesuit friends, or by dishonest recklessness, or perhaps by the strength of youthful passions. They have become, quote, committed to the Jesuits. Okay. Uh, by the commission of some crime to remain their slaves forever after, when we think of that and reflect that if even one man has been kept by a divine power from falling into the trap, yet he will never be believed when he opens his mouth to reveal the <clears throat> when he opens his mouth to reveal the conspiracy, because of the thousands of inter interested persons and many thousands of their slaves who are ready and waiting to scoff him down. 
when we think of all uh, when you think of all that do we not feel overwhelmed by the threats of the impending disaster <clears throat> do we not lose all hope all confidence all energy in endeavoring to avert the evil no <clears throat> there is one thought which can support us and give us courage for the coming conflict, the thought that the Lord, Je the Lord Jesus is King, and that He is the ruler and judge of the whole earth, of the whole earth, that nothing is done upon the earth but He doth He doeth it altogether and further. That <clears throat> quote, there is no evil in the city, but lo, the Lord hath done it. End quote. When nerved by that thought for the struggle which is near, we must yet bear in mind what a potent and unscrupulous factor that Roman Church is, that Roman Church is. Okay, the Roman Church is the largest secret society in the world, besides which Freemasonry is but a pygmy. <laughs> okay, and actually, I'm going to quote to you from this article, the motto of the 30, I'm going to, I'll link this to, the motto of the 32nd degree of Freemasonry, Scottish Rite, is the motto of the Jesuits. Okay. <clears throat> Think of even a part of it. This is the Roman Catholic Secret Society. The Jesuit Society. Okay, so now we're talking about the Jesuit Secret Society. Society of Jesus, the Sons of Loyola. The Jesuits, with this nihilist adherence in Russia, its socialist allies in Germany, its Fenians and nationalists in Ireland. This is the Jesuits. The Jesuits, its accomplices and its slaves and its power. Think of that society, which has not scrupled to stir up the most bloody wars between nations in order to advance its purposes, and yet can stoop to hunting down a single man because he knows their secret and will not be their slave. Hunting him down, discrediting him, and thwarting him at every turn with the cool calculation that they will either drive him mad or make him put an end to himself so that the secret may be buried with him. Okay, this is this, this is a great book. You guys should read it here. Lord Montagu was a government official in England, and like he had a real, like, like I mentioned earlier in this video, his first book was like a full-on papist book, and then he wrote this great book exposing the papacy and the Jesuits, who obviously had a change of heart uh, in the early 80s. Uh, 1880s but this think of a society and he's talking about the jesuits which can devise such a diabolical scheme and then boast of it and say whether a desperate uh and say whether a desperate energy is not required in us like that of a man who wakes in the night and finds the house in flames around him it is hard i know for the poor honest simple-minded protestants without uh guile uh, without guile themselves to realize or even to credit the existence of such an interest intricacy of inquity in such a thick defense of lies, but yet experto, experto uh, crede. That's a Latin phrase there. Um, yeah, so check that book out here, okay? Actually, there's one quote I wanted to show you about James II that I thought was really interesting. And like, for example, I'll show you, there's tons of information on that Gladstone prime minister. You type in Gladstone to the control F bar, there's literally like over a thousand hits that come up. <laughs> Okay, the Jesuits come up quite a bit in this book. Okay, you type in Jesuit. Okay, and again, they're mentioned like over, I think, 300 times. Right around there. Yeah, 269. But I'm going to show you here James. Yeah, I'm going to show you that like, King James II, um, under like, like, yeah, under the kingship, under like the, the, his regime, King James II, the Jesuits made great strides in England, and Montagu talks about here. Okay, to the Jesuits, he, uh, or let me see here. Another historian, Armand Carroll, wrote in 1827 a book on the, quote, counter-revolution in England. It was translated into English and published by uh, Bogue in 1846. Carroll traces the action of the Tyrant Call directly to the Jesuits, and he wrote with the papers of the French Foreign Office at his command. To the Jesuits, he ascribes great power during the reign of king james the second this is interesting here because james uh quote never ceased to conspire with him the orders which he dictated to the council were those which the directors of his conscience had previously sanctioned these were the true ministers who had practical con cognizance of all public affairs through the obscure medium of their police which everywhere superintended and influenced the authorities high and low uh, end quote and then there was in fact quote a secret government, end quote, which overrode the real government of the country, that is England under James II. Even the courts of justice were prostituted and made mere engines of the well-known revenge and spite of the Jesuits against all those who had thwarted their projects or passed censures on their acts. Uh, such a state of things might in one respect be more easily brought about in those days than these. 
For as we learn from certain letters that the Jesuits at League to the Jesuits at, at Freiburg, who had been inter, uh, intercepted in Holland and sent over to England, that King James II had been, quote, received as a member of the Society of Jesus. I thought this was very interesting here. So apparently King James had been, quote, received as a member of the Society of Jesus. Here's a picture of this James II here. There he is, James II of England. Yeah, and he was the last, he says here, right, he was the last Roman Catholic monarch of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Okay, yeah, right here. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Lord Robert Montagu in this book here is saying that King James II was received as a member of the Society of Jesus. And King James II had vowed that the interests of the society should be his one end and aim, and that he would compete the conversion, or he would complete the conversion of the three kingdoms, or else earn a blessed martyrdom in the attempt. Nor was it necessary for him to go abroad every Easter to make his confession and obtain advice from his Jesuit superiors, for Jesuits and crypto Jesuits in plenty had been placed about him, and he had a Jesuit confessor and a quote spiritual director. End quote. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'm gonna show you the cover of this book again here. Um, this is Lord Robert Montagu, recent events. You can get this on archive, I linked it in the description. In his, yeah, U, Library of the University of California. Very interesting book, and just interesting that like he re, like he translated like an official papal book for his first book, Errors Concerning Re, uh, Politics and Religion, and then he exposed the Jesuits in this book. So here's like here's the book here, recent events, the and a clue to their solution. I'm gonna go be going through this book the next. Uh, few days uh i'm probably it's probably gonna take me a week to go through it it's like 700 pages but i just wanted to share it with you guys hey thanks craig appreciate it yeah i hope you guys uh download the book too and uh read it like it just uh it's super informative like even me just going through it for two hours i feel like i've learned a ton of about like the uh the geopolitical situation going on in england and ireland in the late 1800s but uh, that's all for this one, YouTube. Peace and love and uh, Nam Nas.